I'm Alexander Rose, the Executive Director here at Long Now. I'm coming to you from the interval, where I will be joined by our speaker tonight, Peter Leiden, to watch the pre-recorded version of his talk with you all and answer questions live afterwards. Peter has been a longtime fellow traveler with Long Now and has worked with many futurists, authors, and scientists over the past few decades. He periodically has assembled that work into his writings in places like Wired Magazine to lay out some of those predictions. Tonight's talk is based on his latest effort called The Transformation that puts forth some of the seismic changes he sees defining the next three decades and beyond. Welcome, Peter Leiden. Thank you, Xander. And it is a real honor to be speaking here to the Long Now community. It's a community that I have felt a part of for the last 25 years. I'm particularly indebted to several of your founders. Kevin expanded my understanding of technology, Peter about economics and business, Stuart about civilization and long-term thinking. And all three of them are fundamentally optimists. And I share the basic worldview of all three of them as well as their optimism. And optimism actually figures into this project. It started about two years ago, and we were just surrounded with a despair, kind of a zeitgeist of despair in this country and really around the world. It's despair about that we will never be able to solve the challenges of climate change and global warming, that we'll never be able to deal with the gross inequalities in America and other parts of the world, that we wouldn't be able to deal with our political polarization happening in America and also throughout the West. And that ultimately we would never get beyond the racial inequities and the racial tensions that are still coursing through the country. And people just have a fear of the future. They're just bombarded with dystopian ideas of what the future could bring. They can't imagine a better future ahead. To me, there are so many positive developments been happening and are still happening here. There's, it just doesn't map onto the story I see. It seems to me that there's a new narrative of the story of our times, a positive narrative of what's actually happening and what's truly possible. It seems like we really need to tell a story of a much better future that lies ahead. Now, one way to do this is to do what we did back in the 90s was to create a positive but plausible scenario of the future, to let people kind of see what actually that world could be. That's what we did at Wired, and that's what we did using the techniques of global business networks, foresight techniques of scenarios. Now, today, this process might best be called speculative journalism. Speculative journalism is not science fiction, which is just purely imagining another future. It's also not neutral scenario planning, looking in all directions equally. But essentially, it's a rigorous journalistic process of research and reporting to kind of understand more deeply what lies ahead. To me, the way I think of it is you start with a positive reframe. You start to think about what are the underappreciated positive trends out there? What are new technologies just beginning to scale but still kind of under the radar? You also need to do some deep reporting with remarkable innovators who are looking ahead and helping invent that future. And so this project, I really had deep, long interviews with 25 key ones. Many are from the Long Now Network. Many of these folks, as well as others outside this network, helped me actually understand what lies ahead in the next 30 years. So in the end, at the end of last year, 2020, I published a series of stories in Medium called The Transformation. It tells the largely positive story of 2020 to 2050 from the perspective of someone in 2100. But it's more than a story. It's the best case of what I think is largely happening and could plausibly happen in the next 30 years. I think we're on the verge of another technology and economic boom that could dwarf the one we just went through through the last 30 years. It may be not just a long boom, a second long boom too, but a societal transformation. And in fact, we could be making great progress on all four of the era's challenges that I mentioned beginning, including like climate change. By 2100, if we have solved climate change, and when I say solved, I mean mitigated the worst excesses and successfully adapted it to kind of live in a thriving way. If we get through that, we actually will probably have gone through something that's closer to a civilizational change. The era from 1980 to 2100, that period may be understood as something comparable to the Enlightenment. And in many ways, it might supersede it in every way. That's ultimately why I called this whole project, the transformation, to make that direct parallel. So in this talk, I'm gonna make the best case to convince you that we're heading into a bigger long boom than the one we've even been through, and that we're in the early stages of civilizational change. Now to start, I think we should go back to the precursor. 
the cover story at Wired, the book that ultimately went into other languages, The Long Boom. And in fact, it's that piece and that book that really is a precursor to the talk I'm actually going to be giving today. Now, this was a creature of the mid-1990s. This was done 25 years ago. It was created, reported, and written in 1996 and published in 1997. This was the beginning of the digital revolution and the first, what I would call the first era of globalization. These two things were kind of biting right in the mid-90s, but not fully understood. We forget that when you go back there, there was a very similar situation. There was a lot of gloom. There was a lot of fear of the future. People just could not imagine what was lying ahead with these digital technologies and what else. So what we had to think about back at Wired there was what's the big story we're actually in? How could it unfold in positive ways in the coming decades? What would that world look like? In effect, we had to breathe life into the digital global economy. To be clear, it was a positive scenario, one that just focuses mostly on the positive developments that could happen. It's not a prediction. Still, it's worth thinking about how did we do? And I'd argue that we were pretty prescient. We got many of the major through lines largely right. For example, I think we pretty much nailed the fundamental digital technology te developments. At the foundation, Moore's law kept doubling remarkably steady. This wasn't necessarily going to be the case for the mid 90s. The power of computers kept getting better and better. That actually played out. The flip side is the connections between those computers played out perfectly too. This was not, again, inevitable, but it was inexorable. In fact, in 1997, there was about 50 million people on the internet, basically 1% of the global population. Today, close to 60%, more than half the world. If you look at US GDP from 1980 to 2020, it's just a steady upward climb. And particularly in the 90s, it actually just charted out. But again, we weren't just talking about America. We were looking at the entire global economy. And in fact, the twin engine of this era was, of, was globalization that integrated all these economies and kept driving growth. In 1995, China's GDP was a mere trillion dollars or so. It ended in 2020 with more than 16 trillion. In the process, they pulled 800 million peasants out of poverty and became a superpower, all projected in our story. Now, for sure, we got a lot wrong. Uh, and, you know, what do you expect telling a story of the world for the next 25 years? But I'd like to focus on just a few that are relevant to this talk. These were ones that I could learn from going forward and try to correct for in this new project. Now, storytelling trap is one I think about. It's a story of the future is still a story. It's hard to tell a story without details. But given details about the future lays a minefield for the future when you come up to those dates. We had some good projections like when a microprocessor hit 10 billion calculations, 2010. But we failed at how long it would take to get to dealing with genetic diseases, we thought 2015. And we ended our story with, you know, humans making it to Mars, but of course, that was way off. So it's hard to avoid this storytelling trap. The other one's a little more fundamental. Innovation by definition can't really be predicted. It starts with an act of creativity out of someone's head. And so much of the digital global economy was driven by innovation. You know, how do you breathe life into that? A striking example of this is laid out in Brian Eno's 25th anniversary edition of his diaries from 1995, a year with swollen appendices. He talked about all the words that did not exist 25 years ago. If you scan through that list, it's just remarkable when you see how many things just happened, how many names just appeared in the course of 25 years. Now, how could a speculative journalist come up with even a fraction of these. Another one has to do with issues that are rooted in politics. There were many times when politics just screwed up, basically. Screwed up the scenario, screwed up what could flow out. There were things that we did not think about, but kind of diverted huge attention and resources, like when the terrorists hit the World Trade Center and we went off to start not one war, but two. Or there's things that could have happened, but politics kind of got in the way. For example, George Bush defeating Al Gore by a few disputed votes in 2000. Now, we talked a lot about how climate change would get addressed more aggressively in our scenario. Would President Gore have done that? Presumably, probably more than the oil man, George Bush. The lesson from all this is politics matter, which we'll get to in a minute here later. The final one I wanna mention is Amara's Law, attributed to Stanford professor Roy Amara. His quote is, we overestimate the impact of technology in the short term and underestimate the effect in the long run. 
This plays out in scenarios. We need to breathe deeply and slow down. Everything takes longer than you think. So we thought the development of biotech would go much faster than in fact it did. And this makes sense when you think about how government regulation might slow that down. We had all kinds of things happening in that space. The same thing with climate change. We had alternative energy rolling out much faster than in fact it happened. And for that matter, we were much more bullish on hydrogen fuel cells. We clearly were trapped in time. So that's the past. But what about the future? What about the next era? What about this era from 2020 to 2050? The primary way to start thinking about that next period is to understand the underlying tools and technology, really for any era. They define what's possible and they constrain what's not possible. So if you start out looking forward on in technology, you, you realize that we might be heading into three world historical tech booms. There's one in information technology, there's one in biotechnology, and there's one in energy technology. Now, one of the things we learned in that last version of the long boom is that you can get pretty reliably close to the general tech and economic through lines. Now, I had some help from Kevin Kelly, who wrote a book called The Inevitable, about how certain technologies are inevitably going to happen. And Kevin's a little more clear on exactly what he thinks is going to happen. In my case, I think what I'm going to talk about, these inexorables, are not fully inevitable, but rather inexorably moving ahead. They're going to be hard to stop. We can maybe channel them or thwart them or slow them down a little bit. But in general, they're going to play out over the next 10 to 30 years. Now, arguably, all of these things I'm talking about could be positive developments. There are some dangers as well, but generally positive ones from my point of view. The first category is let's look at information technologies. Now, as big a deal as the last 30 years were, we got another 30 years to go. I think of it as Infotech stage two. And the first big thing to focus on is universal connectivity. The next 10 years, we're basically gonna get the second half of the planet online. We've got all kinds of operational projects trying to do this, low orbit satellites like Starlink from Elon Musk. And we've got all kinds of things trying to also boost up the bandwidth to get to 5G. So let's think that one through. If you really think about it, looking ahead, Asia still has about half its people are not online. Africa and the Middle East has about two thirds still not online. Latin America, about 40% to go. So a continued driver of a technology expansion and off that an economic boom is just on the same mechanism that we saw play out in the last 30 years. Now, Think about that for a moment. In 2000, you really only had a handful of Americans online. By 2030, you're gonna have everyone on the planet online. Now, on the backs of all those global connections is gonna come AI. And so we're starting to see now how AI can be used. It's an incredible extension of human capabilities. But we're eventually gonna to get to ubiquitous AI. We're gonna have all digital data is gonna be captured in the cloud. It's gonna be accessible to everyone at all times. And AI is gonna plumb that in myriad ways. One of the ways it's gonna actually do it is getting to natural language translation by AI. It's particularly, this is gonna be useful with the second half of the world coming online who are not educated elites, not able to speak a second language, the business language of English. So what I think we're also gonna see here is a secondary effect of this connections of what I would call accelerated innovation. Innovation is the making cross connections between people from different perspectives, different fields, different expertises. And if you start to think through the impact of that kind of cross fertilization, not just across ideas, but across cultures, across classes, all this mosh pit of cross connection is gonna happen in the next 10 years. Now the flip side of this is kind of related to a forward projection of Amara's law. It's hard to predict how humans are going to leverage a powerful new tool like AI. Too many people are focused on the negative possibilities. How many are factoring it into our abilities to solve our biggest challenges? We will need AI, and I think we will fully use AI over the next 30 years to solve these biggest challenges. I think it's going to end up a net positive and to our benefit for sure. So that's Infotech. Then there's this whole world of biotechnology. Our genetic understanding is already leading to big strides in human health. 
The mRNA breakthrough that just came through in the pandemic is just a taste of things to come. I think we're finally ready to see biotechnology's full impact. Arguably, biotech is where infotech was in the 1990s. Now, the fundamental drivers of information technologies that drove the last long boom have to do with exponential drops in costs, allowing exponential rise in scale. It turns out that the cost curve in genome sequencing is beating Moore's law at this point. In 2000, it cost $2 billion to crack one human genome. By 2010, that cost had dropped to $2 million per one human genome. Today, it's less than a thousand bucks. There's some limit, but ultimately you can imagine over the course of the next decade, it's going to be super cheap, if not close to free. So I think we're underestimating how we could reinvent healthcare. Now we're still in the very early days of CRISPR techniques, but we're on the road to widespread genetic engineering. And we are already moving beyond human health problems into synthetic biology. Now, this is not just genetic engineering, but wider biological engineering. We now are understanding how cells work as well as how the genome works. And we're able to apply that now, not basically to all living things. So, for example, we're already seeing how it's impacting food and ultimately starting to grip into cell-based meat. We could be seeing close to 40 to 50 percent of the meat we eat could actually be uh, cell-based meat uh, over the course of this period we're talking about here. And we could see truly sustainable materials to replace, let's say, the scourge of plastics that's mounting all over. All these things in the biotech field could help our ongoing challenge of dealing with climate change. I think we could see a complete inversion of how we produce things, a fundamental shift to actually grow things with very little waste from the bottom up. Then there's the whole world of clean energy technologies, the third world of technologies to talk about. Now they are following the classic tech cost curve down, and they're also hitting the inflection point of scaling up. Let's take solar, which is the most dramatic and it's kind of the classic example. We needed that last era, the long boom era, to drive the costs down to compete and undermine carbon energy. It took 40 years, but we're now there. When we began the last era around 1980, it was like 76 bucks a watt for solar power. Last year it was down to 22 cents. That's a 350 time price decrease. And what do you know? We're watching the ramp up going on the other side. As those costs came down, the scaling went up in exponential fashion in the last decade. We're now at about 700 gigawatts globally. Still a long way to go to displace carbon again, but remember what the scaling of digital technology was in the 1990s. In fact, if you pull back and look back in the last 20 years, you can actually see how the installed solar globally has risen at in logarithmic scale, granted from a very low installed base. But now the scaling itself is driving the cost down. Every doubling of the industry installed base drives the cost down 30 to 40 percent, which keeps up the virtuous circle of growth. The same dynamic is happening in electric vehicles. In just the last decade, the cost of battery packs for electric cars have been driven down to be almost fully competitive with internal combustion engines. But if you look out for the next decade, they're expected to drop another three to five times. And in the next few years or so, they're expected to be cheaper than internal combustion engines. And so across the board, better, easier to maintain, safer and cheaper fuel. And so what do you know? You're watching the ramping up just starting. We're still again, just in the last decade, we've started to ramp to about 7 million electric cars were sold globally last year. Again, still a long way to go, but remember the 90s and the tech ramp up. So to sum up, you have three world historical tech booms. All three are geared to full global markets. But to really solve these big challenges, we're gonna need politics. Politics can and does screw things up, as we mentioned, but the flip side is that politics matters. Good politics can solve problems. That's not to say that politics is random. The basic pendulum swing between progressive and conservative eras, this back and forth that's played out over American history. But we watch how power shifts to more people-based power in progressive eras and then back to more business power in conservative eras, how the core values move from a more collective sense in progressive eras to a more individualistic sense in conservative eras. We've watched this pendulum swing over time, back and forth. In fact, if you go back 80 years, 
Very similar situation to today. The 1930s, we had extreme political polarization and paralysis. We had mounting authoritarian nationalism, but that opened up a long run of a progressive era, really a 40 year boom. This was the textbook case, strong government, build infrastructure, spread wealth. The Democrats dominated that era, but both parties work within the context. For example, Nixon extended the Great Society as a Republican. But the end of that run in the late 70s, it was becoming outdated, out of ideas, out of energy. And so the pendulum swung again. And so then you watched essentially a conservative era open up. 1980 brought Ronald Reagan to the presidency in about a 40 year run of the conservative dominated time. The boomers dominated the politics. They're much more individualistic and turned out to be conservative. The Republicans dominated, but both parties worked within. Bill Clinton reformed welfare, for example. But again, by the end of this period, the last decade, it ended up outdated, out of ideas, and pretty much corrupt. So I would argue a strong case we're entering another progressive era. This is not wishful thinking, but it's built on the inexorables, this time demographic ones. These cycles are driven by deep demographic forces that build ascendant coalitions. The first is a generational shift. The dominant generations of an era largely drive the politics. Generations have personalities and value sets that pretty much hold through life. The GI generation coming off of FDR drove the last progressive era. The boomers coming off when Reagan ascended kind of drove the last 40 years. So what about this one that's opening up? It's gonna be driven by millennials. Now these millennials have much less stake in the current society. They amassed very little wealth in the last run and they are much more transformative in their thinking. Think Bernie Sanders, that's who is behind him. But if you then add the Generation Z, that's those people born from 1997 to 2012. This generation of Generation Z is very, very similar to the value set of the millennial generation. They seem to align very clearly in all the polling up to now, and it looks like a very little distinguishes between the two of them. We're gonna see with those two generations, a double barreled power that's gonna push for more transformative change. At the same time, if you look how it plays out, the boomers are literally retiring in mass and dying off. By 2040, the youngest boomers, not oldest, are now age 75. And the oldest, they really are passed away. By 2040, the oldest millennials are just hitting their 50s and they're pretty much running everything. So the generation behind Gen Z, who knows, might be budding conservatives. It's not just generations, there's other inexorables too. Growing numbers of people of color. Immigrants tend to have higher birth rates. So in fact, America is clearly on track to be a majority minority population by the early 2040s. This is inexorable, it's happening. Then there's also the relentless migration to cities. The superstar cities on the coast have been the early ones to benefit from this, but all cities, even in the heartland, people are going to the cities. Today, only 20% of America is in rural areas. By 2030, it's projected to be only 10%. People in cities correlate to being more cosmopolitan and more progressive. Think about the politics. Final thing to mention is education. College grads now are more than a third of all Americans. Younger generations are more than 60% are in college or have been into college. Education strongly correlates to belief in science, facts, climate change. Now, how does this play out in politics? All these demographic inexorables hit California first. Remember, California was a red state. It invented modern conservatism. It was the home of Ronald Reagan and the tax revolt. But also California was the first to let go of that conservatism. Today, all statewide offices are run by Democrats. This is gonna play out over America and it's already happening, particularly in states most like California, like the Southwestern United States. If you look at this 2004 map of President Bush, you could see that essentially a lot of red states, this was the high water mark for Republicans since Ronald Reagan. All those Southwestern states are red. If you look at the last election, it just happened with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the southwestern states are all four of them are blue. Just in those 16 years, we went from zero electoral votes blue in 2004 in the southwest to all 31 blue in 2020. We also went from only two Democratic senators in 2004 out of that region to all eight in 2020. And then if you look at that map, you see the state of Georgia 
the heart of the door, Old South went blue. Why? The same inexorables. Young people, immigrants, people of color, the urban area of expanding Atlanta, and the educated people in the suburbs. This is the blue America thing going to the heart of red America too. So if you think through the politics of the 2020s, it's pretty much going to be a blue lock on the presidency and an increasing balance in the Senate. This is, again, counter to the way people think about this now, but it's, I think, inexorable. Remember, in this election, Texas was in play. It's probably going to flip blue in 2024. It has the same dynamic as all those southwestern states, including high rates of people of color and immigrants. North Carolina was in play. Even South Carolina was talked about in play this time. This is a pendulum swing and it is only swinging one way. We are entering a new political era. One inexorable is going to be reinvigorated government. We're going to go for the general strong government tendency that's going to invest in infrastructure and the like. I think we're going to see a rebalanced economy to take on mounting inequality. Young people, people of color, much of the coalition of that blue America has been cut out of the wealth that was engorged in the last era. They've, and they're very attracted to transformative policies like Bernie Sanders and even beyond. Watch for the traditional counterbalance to corporations. After kind of having a free reign with conservatives, you're going to watch a lot more kind of regulation, including in tech. And I think we're going to actually see that wealth inequality being pushed back in the realm of taxation too. The levels of inequality are now back to where they were last seen in the beginning of the Great Depression, where the top 1% own in assets as much as the bottom 90. This was the same phenom that helped start the last progressive era with FDR, and that kind of rolled for about 40 years, and it kind of rectified things. That was reversed again in the 80s with the conservative era, and now we're back to where we started. Expect taxes to go back to historical norms and more. Who was in the streets this summer? People of color and the two younger generations. Those two generations both are about roughly 50-50, whites and people of color. They want no part of white supremacy. They embrace diversity. There's no debate in that. So I think we're going to see in a third shot at rectifying racial inequities in this country, truly. I think it's going to be more like the third reconstruction. The original one coming off the Civil War, the second one in the civil rights era of the 60s. I think we're going to see a third one. The final thing has to do with climate change. There's almost zero climate denial in those generations or in the coalition as a whole. So we're going to see government gear up and set high strategy goals and standards. We're also going to see business align with this, given their workers and customers of these generations. Finally, we're going to see climate cooperation. It's going to really make a difference. Now, if you're really trying to talk about solving climate change, then you got to think globally. We've been mostly talking about America, the liberal democracies of the West. We have to adjust the lens to the big picture global view as well. Now, we have a lot of these technologies are inexorable and that they could scale globally. It turns out there's other inexorables at the global level, too. There's mega trends that are beyond tech that are quite fortuitous. They're largely positive developments that could help us solve a lot of these challenges, too, particularly climate change. One of them is burgeoning capital. We have the technologies, but do we have the capital to transition our entire energy system? to transition the economy to sustainable everything? Well, there's about $100 trillion in capital markets sloshing around right now. It's all looking for productive investments, and it's actually not getting the kind of returns it wants. I think the super tanker of global finance is going to move this decade, and there's signs that it's happening much faster than people think. Another inexorable is Chinese superpowers. China has now, at the end of their 30-year run, become truly a global superpower, and we need them. China can actually move and act in ways that the liberal democracies, as of now, can't. We're still debating in America whether climate change is real, and China is just moving huge amounts of assets. Also, the Chinese model is much more relevant to the developing world. They pulled 800 million peasants out of the poverty into cities in the last 30 years, and that's something that has to happen around the world which brings up total urbanization, another inexorable. In this last decade, the world tipped past 50% of the world now in cities. It's about 55% now, but it's heading to 80% by 2050. This is essentially a good tendency for the planet. 
It lowers the human footprint and brings many other positive developments like empowering women, which lowers the number of children and which essentially reduces population pressures. Another global inexorable is middle class majorities. Just in the last few years, the world crossed another milestone in which we have now 50% of the people on the planet are middle class, 3.6 billion people. Now this is considered middle class in a global context. These are people who can afford maybe something like a refrigerator or a motorbike or have some mild security, unlike people who are really destitute or poor. Now this is not what we think of in the West as the middle class. Those would be considered more almost rich people in a global context. Now, middle class majorities in a global context is a good thing. Middle class people spend almost everything they make back into the economy, driving economic growth. Middle class people tend to be a huge stabilizing force in society. They demand good government. They're trying to get good learning and education, things that are good for everybody in the long haul. By 2030, it's estimated that the world will add another 1.7 billion middle class people to their ranks. This again is global middle class people to their ranks. We're going to have well over 5 billion people who are considered in the global middle class going forward beyond that point. So in summary, I think we can actually solve climate change. It's totally possible. It's plausible. It's even probable, I would argue. We can, when I say solve it, we can mitigate the worst that people are fearing. We can adapt to what's already in motion, already baked in, and we can create a life in which many, many people, the world can really thrive. A final point is that this is not just a story, not just some imaginative sci-fi. This is a work of speculative journalism reported and researched. It's a positive reframe of the actual story of our times. It's a new narrative of what's really going on and what could well happen. I think we're beginning another set of technology and economic long booms. I think this is gonna give us the tools and the resources to help solve our biggest challenges. I think this may well lead to a social transformation and will be seen as the early stages of civilizational change. Now the long now is one of the few places that can hear what I'm saying and totally track it. There's few places, few communities out there that think out 30 to 80 years. Very few talk about civilization. I think of the long now as a 21st century royal society. It's driving a global conversation that people need to hear and it's a group that's maintaining optimism for the long haul. I've been happy to be a part of the long now for the last 25 years and I'm eager to be part of it for the next 25 years, the next generation. I think the next 25 to 30 years are going to be an extraordinary time. I think people in 300 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, let's just say it, 10,000 years, they're gonna look back on our era from 1980 to 2100. I believe America is in one of the biggest junctures in its history. I think the entire planet is in a world historic moment. I think we're going to figure out a 21st century system that works for as many people as possible for the long haul. I believe we're in the transformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, that was fantastic. And I, I, I'm really excited that you can join us here live tonight from the interval. We're able to uh, have both of us here in the studio, though across the room. Um, and um, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. It's great to be here. It's actually interesting to watch yourself as opposed to actually performing it and coming off that talk. So it's interesting to watch me uh, talk to you. <laughs> nice. Cool. Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's especially interesting to you know, in the middle of a pandemic to have a positive view of the future. And I think it's it's welcome. And I think, you know, as, as you and I have both discussed, there were, the, the Roaring Twenties came out of the last pandemic. And um, I think it's it's important to know that at least there is a version of the world that could be much more positive than the one that we're currently living in. So I want to especially thank you for that, because I think it's, it's a difficult project to do now. Um, and uh, I think we need it. Um, but I, I want to just talk a little bit about that in that um, you do mention this kind of storytelling trap and um, most of these things having positive out outcomes. Of course, there's going to be some things that have negative income outcomes or a, a, you know, a weird thing like a pandemic or a 
comet strike or who knows what it's going to be. There'll be something that happens in the next 30 years that um, that is negative. And um, how do you want to address that in context of, of this piece? Well, one of the ways I think about this is the culture itself is just filled with um, all kinds of dystopian rolls out in all kinds of ways of all the disasters are going to happen. I mean, any sci-fi programs, TV shows, magazine articles, cover stories, and mag all the thing is, is we've, we're just bombarded with this. So one of the things I'm trying to do is overcompensate. And, and you know, it, it's a conscious choice of trying to stress that what is getting lost in this look ahead in the future is essentially all these positive developments that are inexorably kind of going along. They're kind of in the backdrop. They don't get the same drama. I mean, you know, the rise of middle class globally, the rise of, you know, the kind of urbanization that's a positive thing. I mean, these things are just backdrop statistics that occasionally surface and people miss. And so in many respects, in this story, I'm just trying to focus on that, knowing full well that there's going to be a completely crazy bunch of things that are going to come up. Up here, including wild cards that'll set us back. Um, for sure, it's going to happen and it will happen. It's kind of, I mean, basically, it's kind of the one one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. I mean, it's just, that's just the way progress happens. That's the way technology rolls out. That's the way kind of economic booms happen. We're going to go into a crazy period of time here, and there is absolutely going to be a lot of negative stuff that's going to happen. And there are going to be times where we'll be wringing our hands thinking, oh my God, it's over. But I think what I'm just trying to lay out there is what is missing. Uh, and largely missing, certainly when I started this project, it was like you couldn't even find anybody kind of trying to talk about the positives of the next 10, 20, 30 years. I will say it's shifted differently. Literally just in the last couple of months, you're starting to watch a kind of a conventional kind of a uh, news way to frame that coming off the pandemic with the pent up consumer demand and you're going to watch with the with the, uh, the vaccines coming together and actually opening up uh, the economy again, that you're going to see some kind of a boom. I think of that as relatively short term consumer boom, kind of the beginnings of, like you say, the post-pandemic kind of roaring 20s. That is a for sure true thing. It is happening and it will happen. But I think what I'm trying to get at is these deeper things that will keep playing out for 10, 20, 30 years and that we haven't really thought through fully what it all means. I mean, when if we are going to shift even the vast majority of our energy system on the planet to clean energies over the course of the next 30 years. I mean, just think of the economic opportunity that and just think about the scale of change that's going to be needed and just think of all the businesses and jobs and all this kind of stuff. I mean, people kind of know it at some level and they kind of think, okay, yeah, somehow we got to do this, but they haven't really thought it through. And I think when you do think that through and you do think that through all these other things, these inexorables I was telling you, and see them in synergistic kind of alignment, it really makes you think, oh, my God, maybe we are heading back into something uh, that is going to be quite extraordinary. Indeed. Well, um, I'm going to move over to some questions from our feed. Um, and then we also have uh, one of the people you mentioned, one of our founders, Kevin Kelly, who will be joining us uh, on the stream. But we have uh, one of our other founders you mentioned, Stuart Brand, uh, watching on the feed and sending a question by text. Um, he says, Pete, why is it easier for people to understand and believe a negative scenario than a positive one? You know, Stuart, that is a great question. I've been thinking about it for the longest time. You know, my basic way of thinking about it is, again, with the long lens of kind of long now thinking, um, is I just think humans have been wired from the beginning to actually be anxious and afraid. The rustle in the bushes, you know, it was, the, it was those humans that heard the rustle in the bushes and freaked out like it was the freaking lying that actually survived in a way that the person that just was a little more la-di-da down, not worried about it and kind of blue sky thinking, oh, it's nothing. And then they got, you know, they, they didn't move on. And so I think it's, it's really just in us. It's just baked into humans of just to actually be constantly anxious about everything. And it's been a survival thing. It's been something that's just right there. So I think it plays into, um, that's one thing I think that happens is people start think when they think about the future they think they, it's they go into it with fear that's one thing that's interesting the other thing i would say is just from the point of view of someone who's been doing this and and as uh through <laughs> wired and global business network where i actually work with Stuart, um it's just so much easier to do negative scenarios i mean it's just easy to unwind anything just blow stuff up make things bad people turn out evil you know it's like easy and it's that's why every damn you know cheap movie b movie you know tv show that's barely you know thought through it's all negative and it's all just spins out disasters right easy to do much harder to make a compelling positive scenario much harder to show get make it exciting and engaging that people can actually see positive things coming together now i think 
I've been always waiting. I've been kind of proselytizing, but she'd have a thing called a genre of movie called Blue Sky Sci-Fi. I think, honestly, we could actually have a whole category of these things where people spin out actually positive features and ways things work. And I don't, I actually, I, it's just, it hasn't happened. Maybe there's some just formula that just never works. But my gut feeling is, particularly with these younger generations, they want a can-do forward thinking this could work frame as much as, oh my God, we're doomed. It's all going to go to hell. You know, and I think I think it might have been, it, we might have been, that was more of a boomer thing, you know, maybe, maybe we're going to kind of go into a kind of more uplifting period here where, you know, people will just as soon kind of see the positive stories, TV shows, books, conversations, whatever. That's a little more speculative for me, but I would say easier to do. And also people just are wired to freak out and they're not wired to actually think confidently and, and thoroughly and consistently uh, about the future. That's what we need to do. That's part of the long range thinking. And I think one of the things that uh, Long Now has been doing, and I think one of the things this community has been doing is trying to structure, structurally and rigorously think forward and also often with a positive and more optimistic frame. I think it's an insta indispensable thing that right. this community well, does. I mean, I think also one of the things, the ways that we create a positive future is by envisioning negative ones and creating the antibodies as a way and creating the kind of the story that we don't want to have come true. And so that's in some way, that's 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 one of the ways we create this negative future. So we tell that story enough that we we invent the things that stop it. I think that's, that's true. entirely possible. I think that's true. But I think there's just enough of that going on that, boy, we need a few more of those positive ones in there. I think I think it's gotten po it, 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 the zeitgeist of despair in this country and in the world in the last five, three to five years. has just been just debilitating. I mean, I think it's just gone on too much. And we need to kind of counter. And I think we're actually are starting to see the, the counter forces starting to pop up here. I think people are ready for, for a positive reframe. Well, I, I'm going to ask uh, one more kind of question on urbanization before we jump over to Kevin Kelly. We have several people asking questions about urbanization, and, and I wanted to ask about it, too. I mean, obviously, one of the biggest um, reasons we could have a reversal trend against urbanization was something like a pandemic. And we're seeing that to some extent, at least getting people further out to the suburbs, you know, San Francisco and New York and LA are kind of, we're seeing now a, a decrease in population, which, uh, you know, Christy uh, from our feed points out. Um, and then that, and on top of that, we have these uh, connectivity trends, which are allowing people to, knowledge workers at least, uh, work from more remotely. Um, and so I just wanted to ask, you know, what is, what is your take on that on that trend, both of de-urbanization um, and are there limits to the urbanization that we currently have that that we're going to see? Uh, interesting question. It's one that everyone's hanging out here. My, my quick hit on both the, the two kind of points I'd really like to make is cities have always emptied out in pandemics and they've always recovered and always come back and they've come back stronger and bigger and, and whatever for always. There is something, just like I said, there's something wired in humans to kind of freak out about the rust in the bushes. There's also a fundamental piece of us social animals, particularly ones who like uh, physical intimacy and frankly, sex and connection with people in, in a way that goes beyond the, the virtual that I think is just this inexorable pull that the cities are going to have. Now that said, uh, so I'm not counting out this, the, the cities on the coast and all, you know, San Francisco, it's been told it's been dead for how many times and it just keeps coming back. But I do think what is interesting about this next phase is because of the uh, high bandwidth connectivity and because of the virtualization of so much, which, by the way, is going to get even more with virtual reality and all the stuff that's going to go even deeper emission of virtualizing things. Uh, I do think we're going to see a... a a revitalization of cities in the heartland, smaller cities all through the place. I mean, you're watching it right now. A lot of people, it, frankly, the superstar cities were just getting unlivable for, for everybody. I mean, no one can buy houses and you couldn't move in, in you know, traffic around here and stuff. I mean, in some ways, people are just in the Bay Area here where I'm in and where you are is like, finally, we can just drive around and finally we can actually do some things that has just been so hard to do. Right. Yeah. Now, talking with kids who are starting college. Uh, this year, uh, they are pretty ready to get out of their oh homes and dorm God. rooms and get back to a party <laughs> for sure. Um, all right, so we're going to invite uh, one of our founders and one of the people you referenced in the talk, Kevin Kelly, um, who worked with you a little bit on this piece as you were doing. Oh, I, it. So I will say, Kevin. Kevin, I've had many conversations with Kevin, and he has been very instrumental in helping in this project and helping influence my thinking over the last 25 years. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. So glad to be here. You did a great talk, Pete. I was inspired. I want to be part of that future. Please, let's make it happen. 
I'm down for I'm down with it. Let's do it. <laughs> so, um, what one of the questions I would have is, um, what kind of reaction do you get when you tell this very positive story to people? Maybe people who have he- heard only the pessimistic view. Um, do they find it persuasive? Can um, are they able to believe in it? Um, in general, are you able to convert people? Um, that's an interesting question. I, I would say people are are wi- what's wrong the wrong word wired. People their knee jerk reaction to it is, oh, that's po- too positive. You you can't be too positive. It, it's that's just not how the world works. It's it's not workable. Uh, it's it's dead end. It's not a non starter. I mean, that's honestly, and there's a lot of super smart people. Um, who, when you talk about this, it's just, oh, no, 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 no. And I think there's something weird about that. I think, I think what it is, is I think educated people, intellectuals particularly, are kind of, um, raised and are just surrounded by news, magazine, anal- analysis, books. I mean, all the kind of intellectual thing is almost, is, I would just put a number on it, you know. 80% of it is somehow negative, you know, and there's a lot of people kind of wringing their hands about the negativity of news and stuff. But when you're kind of in an, an environment like that constantly and just it's just seeped into your pores, it's just the way you think about everything. When someone comes around with a totally different way that's positive and reframed and, and kind of has it's, it's thought of as naive or it's thought of as like, uh, you know, oh, that can't be right or anyhow, there's just some weird thing. So, yeah, it's a frustrating thing. I will say this. It's not just this project. I've been doing this. I've been doing this. For the last 25 years, I've been doing a lot of public speaking, and I'm always positively saying it. I will say this. People love at least to go for the ride for the hour-long talk or something. They actually like to do it because it's so rare to do it. And they're kind of like, wow, wouldn't that be cool? There's a lot of them that actually do that. And so um, I don't think it's a lost cause to push that rock up the hill. But I do think, because uh, I think people are open to it, and when they see it, they have a thrill for it, but then they pretty much settle back into their negative space. So I think it's more like maybe building a movement or building a, a body, a consistent media landscape that has more of this. I don't know. It needs it needs more voices. It needs more energy. It needs more ideas. That, this, And I know you've been thinking about this, too, um, with your Protopia thing. I mean, I think people need to things to hang on to. They need to grab it. They need stuff. And that's really what this project was, was just let's get something in writing, which is where in Medium, by the way, anyone can watch this, uh, The Transformation. It's a series of six stories in there. Um, this talk will be one and other venues that I'm going to kind of keep pushing this because we just need to keep banging the drum that uh, you got to stay open to this and really not only open to it, but really engage it seriously and think, uh, why not? I mean, why isn't why isn't this? Why isn't the narrative right now that we're on the cusp of an amazing era of reinvention of America, an amazing era of scaling up to solve global problems, to kind of harness AI and take advantage of biological engineering? And why isn't there this kind of totally, you could amazing, you could imagine a narrative of that. It's based on the tools, the rally. You can, there's people doing it in a million different directions, but that's not the narrative. The narrative is this, everything's screwed up. Everything's going to go wrong. Everything's going to, you know, AI is going to overrule us. Biotech is going to, you know, we're all going to be, you know, mutants. And anyhow, it, you know, the whole story. It's, it's, it's a, it worries me, <laughs> but it's something I'm doing my best to counter. It's the best I can. So, so um, your, your vision, your story has a little bit of a very global kind of tech view. The politics are very U.S. focused. I increasingly have come to believe that uh, more and more, the future is going to be decided by non-Americans, the young non-Americans of the world that you kind of hint at. And um, uh, do you have a sense of, of their politics? Um, and w- wouldn't that be a better audience for this talk is the young of China and India? Because in a certain sense, those are the people who are going to be making our future. Good point. I know that's something that you've always championed. In, and one of the exciting things about the connectivity that's to come and this, again, kind of uh, interconnection through language and, and uh, understanding 
is going to come with the potential to do that. I mean, you know, right now it's hard to figure out a way to actually communicate and, and really get your eyes, uh, your, your ideas out that way. So anyhow, it is something that I, um, I know that's maybe not the best way to answer your question, but I do think uh, to the extent we're going to be able to kind of proselytize and spread the word, I think, I think what it is is for those of us in the West here is to actually... Uh, help energize and help empower essentially the folks that I do think will build the future. I'm a little worried about the China, the Chinese way. I do think there's still two systems existing right now. And although the liberal democracy world is kind of decadent and not working very well, I'm a little concerned about a kind of more mm, authoritarian kind of Chinese version and to what extent that's uh, I, I think of it that they're comparable. There's trade-offs with both. And I think that's why I see them as allies in the solving climate change thing. But I don't know if, um, I don't know which is better in the long run. And I'm, so I'm still not kind of going that as far as that. So, so uh, maybe my last question is, um, uh, I, I'm with you that we don't really need to um, drum up more dystopians and negative scenarios because there's machines that do that already very well. But I am interested is, is um, if you had a magic wand that could remove one hurdle, the biggest hurdle you see for this vision coming true, what would that one hurdle that you would like to see be removed? What, what, what is the sort of the biggest headwind against this um, half happening? Wow, that is an interesting one. Um, from the global yeah. point of view or from the no, American from the global point of view? Point of view. Um, if it was a magic wand, if I could literally just yeah. do a magic wand. Um, to me, what's missing, maybe this isn't as big enough to swing with my <laughs> magic wand that I have, but I, but I think if, what I think is missing right now is people cannot comprehend, they cannot think, they cannot envision, they can't see how a better future works in a kind of more comprehensive way. They don't understand how could the economy work to be more kind of equitable and kind of rework wealth differently and deal with mitigating inequality. They don't understand how would we really uh, solve climate change in the you know reasonable time here to kind of stay under the kind of global warming kind of levels that we got to worry about. They don't see how would you rethink a more global world that is kind of working on a planetary scale and, you know, beyond the borders of a bunch of collection of nation states. I mean, there's a bunch of things that people are just, they don't get it. And so they, they say, hang back and they hold in their, 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 their kind of position. And they even look backwards and say, well, God, wouldn't it be good if we just did it what we did in the 20th century or, you know, some people are going back all the way to the founding fathers and saying, you know, originalists, you know, do what they did, you know, in the 1780s. Like, anyhow, it's a backward looking thing. So, I, but I think what's happening is it's hard to envision that future. It's hard to see it. And if there's some way, maybe it's different kind of media, different kind of thinking, different kind of mental tools or something that would just help people see more clearly, rigorously, thoroughly, comprehensively what could lie ahead. I think it would energize uh, people to do to start doing it in a way. I think it's it's right now it's 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 missing the missing piece is the envisioning piece, and not in a ton of trite way of just you know oh, we'll build a better life and we're all going to be better. It's like how do do these future systems work? How could they work? Can I mortgage my future on it? Can I mortgage my kids' future on it? Can I you know, move in that direction? Can I let go of my own career and move into that career? I mean, it's hard for people to see that. And that's why I think the whole field of futurism and I think the whole field of, of kind of thinking uh, systematically about the future is so valuable and it's so still crude and still kind of unformed. And I think, boy, if I had a magic wand, some way we could just do that with more kind of uh, crispness and, and clarity and uh, to make it things more convincing, I think it would be awesome. And it would mobilize political will and, and energy in new ways uh, that I think we're lost right now because we can't make people see it. And this is my little vague way of in this you know talk or in this series showing one way that if you just suspend disbelief a little bit and think about it, it's just helping people see that through light, see what's out there. Uh, it's a pale attempt. It's one attempt, but uh, boy, we need more of us doing it. That's what I would say. Well, well you, there's my one. Well, your magic worked on me this evening, so thank you.
Thank you. Well, it's always good to hear that from you, Kevin. I appreciate that. Thank you, Kevin. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, we're wrapping up the Q&A right now. We're past the top of the hour. Um, I will say this this talk generated more online questions than I think any one of our online talks so far. So you have definitely got people's attention. Um, and but we have we have several questions, one from Nick, uh, one from Michael Hertz on this kind of where does decentralization and centralization play out? And I think, you know, we see forces of centralization right now, you know, obviously in the big, huge tech companies like Facebook um, and Apple and these kind of silos of technology that are owning Google, that are owning so much of our online world. We see um, versions of decentralization with uh, forces like, um, you know, more open web type sources like Wikipedia winning out over Britannica or, um, you know, these, you know, Craigslist largely winning out over, you know, online classifieds of other types. Um, and I think now we have other forces that are kind of coming in sideways to that, like cryptocurrency, um, obviously being another decentralizing force that are potentially an economic decentralizing force. And so I just wanted you to, if you have a chance to talk a bit about where centralization and decentralization, both either technology and econ economics um, work out in this. Yeah, good, good question. Um, and uh, for those who asked it and, and yourself too asked it, here, here's the way I'm thinking about it is um, in the relative short term, I think the forces of decentralization are actually going to be where the energy is going to go. Um, and, and I think, you know, the era of, you know, the nation state, we all look to, you know, Biden and his cabinet to solve everything that that's that era is less and less a thing that was kind of a thing. And it was a 20th century thing more to be less and less. It's more like, oh, what's California doing or what's the crypto crew, you know, get energizing, you know, some outfit in, you know, whatever, another country. Anyhow, there's I think there is a decentralized thing. I think this also includes tech. Uh, I think. Um, I, but here's but here's the here's the difference. So so there's a decentralizing thing that I think is still the predominant thing energy of where the where the air is going to go. But here's the problem, and it's an interesting switch. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this as I talk more civilizationally. We didn't really get into that in this part of the talk. Just you can only do so much in 35 minutes. But um, the ultimate challenge that's going to happen to the planet, particularly if we try to solve climate change in a way that's going to work is we have to operate on a planetary scale. And it seems to me that there's going to have to be some kind of global governance at some level or global coordination that I don't necessarily think it would be centralized, like it's going to be some little cabal of people that runs the global planet. But there is some kind of another level of world historical not centralization, but coordination at, at a global level that we've never seen before that we're going to need. That's going to happen, I would say, Increasingly in the next 30 years, but across the century, that is going to be a thing. Um, but uh, but anyhow, and, and so it's this global reconnection at a global level beyond the boundaries of states and and nations and stuff. That is, is, is an energy that's going to take the whole century to figure out. But basically that thing is what's also screwing up and countering this uh, decentralization thing. So, for example, the reason... These tech companies are all so huge right now. There's just one simple reason. The digital environment is totally global. There's no boundaries on, the, on that. And so when Facebook can have a two and a half billion people on their platform. And that was only because there's a global economy they're seamlessly tied into, right? So, but that's not because, oh, that's the best way to organize social media is, you know, centralized. It's just like, hey, 15 years ago, they started this thing. The borders were open globally. They scaled. They just kept scaling. And in fact, frankly, they didn't even know what hit them. They moved, grew so fast. Now they're like, holy shit, what are we? Now we're the most powerful companies in the world. I mean, I think this is the thing that people overestimate. They think that all these tech titans, you know, were these wanted to take over the world. No, they didn't even know what to hit them. There's just, there's like, this is wild ride for them as, as it is for anybody to watch this happen. So I think it's not like that's the most successful way to go. It's that that's the scale we're starting to work at is globally. And so I think, it still is nimble, decentralized, uh, innovative. Um, I mean, all that thing is still better. And ultimately, we're going to see Facebook and all these are going to go the way of, you know, IBM and, you know, the whole thing. I mean, it's like it's just going to we're going to watch the cycle again. Who's going to be the next updraft? 
Is it Zoom or whatever? Anyhow, there'll be something. But it's not because the superior thing is, oh, the big centralized thing. This, it's, it's essentially this scaling thing that we haven't really thought through fully and we haven't really understood. And that is going to be one of the biggest challenges in the next 30 years is going to be figuring out how do we do that? Because it's inevitable. That one I'll say is inevitable. It's inexorable too, but it's like uh, by the end of the century, we're going to organize the planet on a, you know, it's going to be one system. It is already one system at some level. We're just haven't figured out how to do it very well right yet. Uh, but it's, it's going to happen. Again, I'm an optimist, so I'll say we'll see. Well, and I'll, that leads perfectly into our last question. Uh, we have several questions really on, you know, on growth economics, growth of everything. You know, we know one of the other things, the inexorables and demographics that's going to happen in the next um, 30 to 50 years is peak population. And we already see it, as I said, in the, in the developing or developed world. And we're going to see it in the developing world where populations are starting to go down. And so economics are likely going to be have to start shifting in the way that they um, that they work. So I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, do we think that there's going to need to be different economic models? I think when, when you published this story, and for instance, there was a, a book came out called Dow 30,000, which everyone totally ridiculed. And strangely, we actually hit it in the middle of a pandemic, um, you know, certainly maybe a little bit later than that person expected. But if, if we did hit it and, and went blue right past it in the middle of what should have been the you know, most global economic downturn that we've ever, ever had. So clearly these things are starting to decouple already from normal human trends and demographics to other things. So I, I just wanted to get your thoughts on where growth leads in the next 30 years and how that plays out in this, in this world. Well, okay, I thought you were going to go in a different direction, than that, but I'll say two things about this, which I think is interesting. So what you mentioned is in the 90s, when we kind of projected out to 2020, um, it was true. Uh, on top of a tech boom and an economic boom, we, the stock market was going to go. We didn't push it, but it was clearly the thing. And in fact, it happened. But here, here's the thing is it, it was, again, that was a thing of, a, again, the scaling thing. It's just like people, people don't understand exponential. That's one of the, actually, if you really want to get down to it, is most people don't understand what exponential growth is. And I was trying to show it in those charts about how it's happening now in, in energy, it's happening in, in, in biotech, and it's, we, we've been happening in infotech. And so these things go from manageable and understandable to like, holy shit, how did that happen? <laughs> kind of thing. And so I think that's kind of, if you just heard my talk here, I'm not going to be telling you, oh, the stock market should collapse tomorrow and it's all a bubble. I'm actually, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, the current stock market and the choices are, you know, necessarily the future. But I would say there is going to be an insane amount of wealth to be made in the future here. And I think we're going to watch that happen. Now, the critical piece of this, which is I thought it was what you're going to go to, is it cannot happen on the old technologies and the old carbon energies. If that happens, we're screwed. I mean, we're totally doomed, honestly. But I think this is the beauty of what the moment we're in here is we can actually grow the entire global economy on clean energy, sustainable everything. The way I say this is like, you know, synthetic biology, packaging will be, you know, grown rather than kind of plastic and petrochemicals. Anyhow, all that kind of stuff. There is, we know how to do this now. Now, we don't know how to do everything about it, but we're, we're, we're past the tipping point of understanding that. One last little thing I'll say about this, which, which, I, um, which is a good way to think about this, which is we are so lucky that the pandemic hit in 2020, rather than just 20 years ago in 2000. If we would have hit 20 years ago in 2000, the same pandemic, there would have been about mm, 25 million, 50 million Americans online and nobody else. You wouldn't have these open channel video things all over the world. You wouldn't have scientists coordinating all, all over the planet. You wouldn't have kids being able to go to school and video. Everybody work from home. That gone 20 years ago. That's all it would take. Second thing is we wouldn't even have cracked the first human genome. We didn't even know how to do a genome. And uh, now we're following the, the, you know, the virus as it's mutating by the day. And it's like everybody can do it and they share it instantaneously. That couldn't happen. Uh, and the same thing was uh, we crashed the global economy. We paused the global economy and all the oil industry crashed and, you know, everything crashed. If this had been 20 years ago, well, there's no way we could have scaled back up on clean energy like solar or wind or any of that. It was so immature. It wasn't there. So anyhow, the point is we're lucky it's today. The triple whammy happened today. We're lucky because we could actually do all that amazing. Think what's going to happen in another 10, 20, 30 years. We're going to be increasingly lucky that, oh, we could solve the global climate crisis of 2040 because, holy shit, we've, everybody has 
AI enabled everything and you know we got sensors all over the planet blah 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 anyhow there's a bunch of ways that happened so I just think it's a, we, we need to keep thinking um, how this is possible uh, and we're un, we got to keep our minds open our imaginations over what could happen in the next 10 20 30 years as this happens and I think I think we're past the point where we we now can actually grow the global economy robustly and still not blow out the planet and do it on a sustainable kind of everything plan. And, uh, you know, it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be one step forward, two steps back kind of thing, as we mentioned. But over time, if we have this conversation in 2050, uh, most of this will largely have played out. This is what <laughs> I'm trying to say. Nice. Well, we it, want to extend the invite for you to come back in February of <laughs> 2050 um, to report back on the things that, that came out as, as planned and the big surprises that uh, that hit us over the I last I will do it and as years. long as the interval is open and you can actually get a drink rather than kind of uh, been sitting in a pandemic like this. But yes, by that time, we won't have to worry about the pandemic. Yes, I will do that. Looking forward to it. I'm also looking forward to being part of this community in the next uh, 25 years here, uh, 30 years to it. And uh, thanks for having me here. Indeed. Well, we'll step outside and have a have a rare interval drink uh, outside uh, <laughs> shortly after this talk. So thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I want to thank you, our Long Now audience, for sticking with us during this pandemic and during these pre-recorded talks. Um, we'll have more coming up in the future. And thank you so much.